Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Daniel Benjamin. I'm the director of the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this conversation with Steve Call. Um, most of you probably know uh, the highlights of Steve's rather remarkable career, but just to uh, uh, touch some of the peaks. He is now the uh, dean of the Columbia School of Journalism, um, a staff writer at The New Yorker, the former CEO of the New America Foundation, the former managing editor of The Washington Post, and a two-time winner of the Pulitzer Prize, including for Ghost Wars, The Secret History of the CIA, Afghanistan, and Bin Laden from the Soviet Invasion to September 10th, 2001. As if that weren't enough, um, he has written uh, a number of other uh, extraordinary books. Uh, the one I've been uh, rereading is The Bin Ladens, An Arabian Family in the American Century, uh, and, which was um, a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for Biography. His most recent book is Private Empire, Exxon Mobil, and American Power, which won the Financial Times Goldman Sachs Award as the best business book of 2012. Uh, he has won more awards uh, than, as Groucho Marx used to like to say, you could shake a stick at if you were into that sort of thing. And he is very simply one of the preeminent writers of nonfiction in the country today. I am uh, absolutely delighted that he has joined us here today at Dartmouth, and I'm particularly grateful because I know that he has just finished a six-city tour uh, uh, visiting with uh, Columbia J School grads. Two of those cities were on another continent, so um, uh, my gratitude is that much, that much greater. Uh, I have known Steve since, I think, 2001, thereabouts, when um, uh, he interviewed me for uh, Ghost Wars, and I've always been grateful for the nice things he wrote about me then. Um, I have a hard time getting people to focus on those, and I've thought about handing out little cards that have the quotes on them. Um, but um, I thought that it was time to turn the table, and I uh, wanted to invite him up here uh, to interview him a bit. And um, yeah, he always has some of the most interesting things to say of just about anyone I know, so I'm really, really pleased he's here, and I hope you'll give him a warm welcome. So, Steve, Let's um, start out with those last three books, uh, really the last decade of production. Um, you've taken on the CIA, the Bin Laden family, and ExxonMobil. The poet uh, Yeats had that great line, the fascination of what's difficult. What gives? I mean, what, <laughs> can you just take on some easier targets? Yeah, I, I keep uh, thinking I should be writing about baseball or something <laughs> uh, where people will talk to you. But How about the Kardashians? Yeah, the Kardashians. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, I did. Um, I mean, I love to report, and I love uh, to be motivated by a difficult project, and each of those had their own story. I won't uh, bore you with where they each came from, but I will say about, uh, about halfway through the Exxon project, which was a four-year reporting project, I realized I had done this, I, that my last three projects had been the CIA, the Bin Ladens, and ExxonMobil, and I have to say ExxonMobil was by far the hardest subject of the, and it was the only one where I was actually afraid that a white van might pull up someday and just buckle me <laughs> off the street, take me off the street. But uh, you do learn lessons about how to report on closed institutions, and, and that uh, I got better at as I went along. And uh, they were each different uh, problems, and, and each institution responded to my work in a different way. But, but you, you get, uh, it's essentially, it's an outside-in project, and that, from a, for an investigative reporter or a reporter, that's what's fun because you end up just chipping away at the wall from so many different angles. And if you were reading their Bin Ladens, I mean, most of the insights in that book, a lot of the narrative stitching came from civil litigation in the United States in state right. courthouses, just going with the things that I used to do when I was 23, going down, digging into divorce files involving Bin Ladens, traffic accidents. I mean, there turned out to be tons of civil litigation in which various Bin Laden's brothers, half-brothers, and sisters of Osama had sued somebody or another over something. Right. And in those files was basically the story of the family. But it was sitting alone in the Orlando County, or whatever the county, Orange County Courthouse around Orlando, Florida, reading these litigation files and then realizing they had depositions and disclosures by the family about all kinds of things that, frankly, I don't think our government had ever looked at. 
and you have those kind of eureka moments where you're like, wow, yeah. this is really. They um, also had a, a bad habit of crashing planes. And crashing also planes, a yes. Lot of, <laughs> yeah. Before, this is well before 9-11, it's yeah. important to know that yeah. Mohammed bin Laden, the, the patriarch, and the son also both died in plane crashes. Yeah, indeed, that was a, 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 a kind of motif of, and in fact, the father, who was an amazing man, self-made man, built this huge construction company up in, in Saudi Arabia it, during the early days of the uh, oil boom. And he was the first private subject in Saudi Arabia to own a private jet. And he had all American pilots. And uh, he had an office, a procurement office on Broadway and this big multinational workforce. And Osama clearly took inspiration from his father's sort of leadership of these multinational groups and camping out in the desert, a lot of eerie sort of parallels. But the eeriest of all was that his father was flying to this border with Yemen mm -hmm. where the bin Ladens had these uh, uh, Bechtel-like contracts to build defense infrastructure with an American pilot in charge. And the American pilot basically made an error in the approach to a desert strip and uh, crashed and, and killed the father. And then the family business and the family empire fell to the control of the eldest son, Salem bin Laden. And uh, 20 years later in San Antonio, he went ultralight flying on a Sunday morning and uh, lost control of his plane and crashed and died. So you had uh, every trauma in the life of the bin Laden family was a plane crash involving Americans. Uh, so um, I tried not to make too much of that, but I couldn't help but take notice right, of no, it. It's, a, yeah. it's quite a motif. You, um, um, I, I'll praise you shamelessly now. Um, first of all, I think you got in that book inside of Saudi Arabia in a way that no one else has, has done. And I do think it's one of the most remarkable and strange places mm. uh, on earth. Um, but you, uh, how long did you spend there when you were, because you spent a lot of time working on your Arabic. Right, well, so I first uh, started when I was the correspondent for the Washington Post in Delhi, the first Gulf War, or I guess some people call it the second Gulf War, <laughs> then, uh, triggered by Saddam's invasion of Kuwait uh, in August of 1990 broke out and we were all hands over to the war. So I spent a lot of time in Saudi Arabia waiting for the war to start and doing feature reporting. And I was relatively naive about what Saudi Arabia was, so I was reading and banging around Riyadh and Dhafran. And, and uh, so I first started to be interested in Saudi Arabia then and uh, went back a few times. And then um, when I decided to write about the Bin Ladens, it was exactly because I felt as someone who had spent some time in Saudi Arabia, always outside of the kind of palace bubble, you know, on in trying to report on the streets, very hard place to work because there are really no points of entry for a journalist. Normally, if you go into a new country, you have uh, academia, universities, professors, human rights groups, civil society, maybe newspapers, media companies, places where you can start, NGOs. Saudi Arabia, you basically have none of that. And there's no free uh, speech on university campuses. There's barely any human rights organizations. The press is an arm of the government communications wing, and there are interesting people in all those places, but it's not an easy place to work. So, yet I'd gotten to know all these Saudis, and I felt like there was a story of the complexity of Saudi modernization, basically the consequences of the oil boom for the generation that came of age with all this sudden wealth, the shock of the oil boom, and the way it created these you know, barely prepared global, pers global lives, uh, represented by the 54 brothers and sisters of the bin Laden family in Osama's generation, they basically had suddenly these allowances of, you know, 200, 300, 400 thousand dollars tax-free 1970s dollars in cash after previously living in the proverbial Bedouin tent and they could go out into the world and purchase any life they want. And with that book, I was, had in mind these books I'd read in college, multi-generational narratives of the Rockefellers or the Kennedys or the Fords, and it was sort of an American event. And uh, so, yeah, it was the hardest uh, reporting outside of you know certain parts of the Exxon project because you looking for our government. <laughs> um, one theme that you uh, mind really. Uh, in a fascinating way in that book, which um, had interested me a lot in, in what I had written on uh, the original uh, terrorists of uh, Al-Qaeda was the identity challenge that they felt as they shifted between moder sort of modern West and, and their, I would say, more traditional thoughts and their own thoughts of themselves as being somehow 
contaminated by the West that causes a reaction and a religious revival uh, kind of pattern. For me, this was evident in a lot of the people who were found in the United States on the uh, either in the Ramzi Yusuf case or later on in some of the later um, conspiracies. But um, that, that is one of the really fascinating things you see about Osama, but a lot of the bin Ladens and a lot of the people around them too. Yeah, I mean, well, Saudi Arabia is a very, um, you know, it's a very proud society. It was never colonized outside. I mean, Jidda is a complicated international city, but Riyadh, the central um, uh, high desert and the tribes that lived there and small oases and they were never conquered because nobody saw any reason to go into those deserts. The Brits built these strings of ports along the Gulf and they would occasionally take expeditions to Riyadh. And, and so you have a society that's been pretty well organized uh, tribally and pretty stable, pretty proud for a long time. And then here comes this sudden wealth, uh, extraordinary wealth, uh, transformational, in just a period, two short decades, you know, for a society that had sort of 300, 200 years of uh, Un, uninterrupted uh, social history. And it comes with planes and telecommunications and, and all these opportunities. But in Saudi Arabia, the public life is so f uh, thoroughly religious. There really is not um, a plurality of public life. Uh, if you turn on the state television, uh, you know, you, there, is, there are whole channels just devoted to uh, continuous streaming photography of Mecca and so forth. And so even if you want to live a balanced life, let's say, a balanced global life, I mean, people literally change their uniforms on the plane between London and Saudi Arabia. And you live one way when you're in the kingdom, and uh, you live another way when you're outside. And that's one way that Dubai has thrived, is it's, it's you know, what, stay, what, what happens in Dubai stays in Dubai, and everyone, it's a short hopping flight. Uh, for, and, and so all those versions of uh, divided lives you know, can dislocate the occasional person. Some, one person or another, and, and Osama was an example of this, just decides in reaction to that palette of choices, I'm going to be pure in one way or another. And, and you know, the last thing I'd say about that identity piece in Saudi Arabia is that you know, we used to think, we, we still have thought of Osama's story as a story, and we often think of this with jihadist cases, biographies of people who have carried out a terrible violence or have uh, turned into suicide bombers. For us, the mystery of their lives is a turning point of radicalization, right? It's a radicalization narrative. They were going along in some kind of normalized way, and then something happened to turn them. Well. I think that's not quite the way to read Osama's life because when he went to the jihad, he was doing so with the affirmation of his family, his society. I mean, he was, he was seen as a volunteer the way, with pride, the way families would have seen the volunteerism of their college-age children who went to New Orleans after Katrina to, to, to hammer houses together. You know, it was a righteous cause celebrated in public and in fact within his own family, Osama was a kind of marketing strategy to the ideologues in Saudi Arabia. They said, well, we have, we've got one religious brother. Some of us have blue jeans and you know, rock and roll clubs in Beirut and houses in California, but, but we're a Saudi family and you should meet our, you know, our brother Osama. He'll, you know, he'll knock your socks off. So he was affirmed in these attitudes. It was, he, he became so prideful in part because he was um, celebrated. So you uh, already anticipated my next uh, question. I was going to ask you if you were going to be the victim of a rendition by the CIA, by the, um, the Bin Laden or, Ex or Exxon, which one <coughs> would you least <laughs> like to be in the custody of? I think you've already answered yeah. that, but uh, it's a good segue to uh, talking about where we are. You've been writing a lot for The New Yorker about uh, where we are in the, uh, in the confrontation with transnational terror. And um, uh, I'd be interested to uh, get, your, uh, get your sense of things. Um, uh, in, in March, for example, you uh, were fairly critical of taking the franchises uh, too seriously, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb. You didn't mention Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula I well, I did. in that I, piece. But, I think I did. Well, yeah. we'll go back and check. Okay, yeah. um, get your and, fact and, checker and by on the way, that. while we're <laughs> talking about fact checkers, the New Yorker, legendary for fact checking, says you are still president of the New America okay, Foundation. Okay. So I just want to ask about pass that, that yeah. on. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> not that I want to rat anyone out. Um, but um, 
since you wrote that piece, though, we had the uh, the gas works attack in uh, Algeria. Perhaps that had happened beforehand, but we've right. also had uh, uh, we've had the collapse of uh, Mali, of northern Mali. We've had uh, the Westgate Mall in um, in Kenya. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more activity at Al Shabaab. What what do you what do you think uh, these days? Where where do you think we are? Right. Well, I mean, there's two different subjects. Um, w one is uh, what is the structure, the changing shape of, let's call it, uh, Al Qaeda inspired or jihadist extremist violence uh, across the world, and then there's a separate question, which is our habits of naming uh, Al Qaeda and how they play out in our public policy, and whether we're um, as rigorous and self-aware about some of the habits of language that we've gotten into in our public policy. So just to take uh, both of them at the same time, you know, the question of what al-Qaeda is has always been a very complex one. As you well know, you wrote about it very early. It, and I, one of the ways that I would uh, describe it, for, for my two cents, is that it has always been a number of things at the same time. So it's been an organization with a distinct history, leadership, management committees. It's also been a coalition or a network of like-minded groups, an alliance, uh, various degrees of ties among those like-minded groups. It's also, in addition to that, always been an aspirational movement and a, a set of ideas that might inspire people to act without any contact with the organization or its leaders. And then it was also, particularly under Osama's uh, leadership, it was a brand. It was a kind of a marketing uh, idea. There was a there was a use of the Al Qaeda uh, sort of narrative and, and name uh, on satellite television to skip over the obstacles of national government in Saudi Arabia and other authoritarian societies and talk about Al Qaeda as something that was responsive to local conditions in a way. So, um, so it's uh, to define yourself as at war with something called Al-Qaeda requires you to come to terms with all these different meanings of the, of the phrase. And, and uh, so we're not, you know, it's, it's hard then uh, when, we, when we have built a whole series of policies and regimes around that framework uh, to continually update ourselves about what we mean. Do we mean the central organization? Do we mean franchises with X degree of coherence and tie to the central organization and so forth? And, and I guess what I was saying in that essay is that when you look at the criminal networks in uh, Mali, uh, the kidnappers and the extortionists, the people who are running drugs for the Colombians and calling themselves Al-Qaeda because when you go to the next village, that's what scares people. Or when you kidnap some you know, hapless French expat uh, engineer in Niger and you're jacking up the ransom, call yourself Al-Qaeda. Well, you know, all right, so that's not, that's not the same thing. Now, as to the underlying pattern, you know, clearly the, you would know this better than me and, and if you um, had access to all of the um, classified information that you have now systematically erased from your mind, you would probably describe in more uh, detail than, than me. But I mean, basically, the big headline narrative is that the pounding that Al-Qaeda, the central organization, took in western Pakistan along the Afghanistan border during the first <coughs> Obama term, which was partly a, a result of the surge of American troops into Afghanistan, which led to a whole series of strikes inside Pakistan that were also aimed at protecting deployed American forces, not just at decimating al-Qaeda there. But that whole pounding, all of those drone strikes that have been documented, um, uh, it's broken up the central organization. And simultaneously, not causally, uh, groups that were in Yemen and in North Africa and in Iraq, each with their own pre-existing, you know, their own precursor narrative, um, have gotten relatively stronger with Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, the group that was basically kicked out of Saudi Arabia and reformed itself in Yemen. That group obviously has been the most potent in the area that we would be concerned about most, which is the ability to carry out a complex transnational attack possibly inside the United States. So they're really the only group right now that has demonstrated that capacity. But the groups that are 
the Al Qaeda in Iraq sort of morphing group that's now taking root in Syria, and uh, and you know certainly the Shabab remnants and allies that have attacked in Nairobi, they've demonstrated the ability to carry out a certain level of complex attack, although not to cross oceans and and uh, hit European or American cities. Well, <clears throat> I, I agree with you to uh, to a large extent. Um, I, it seemed to me early on you were being maybe a little more dismissive of some of these groups, and I do think you're very right about the point about Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, which really a bunch of thugs um, who um, upped their game significantly once uh, in, at the gas works, but who really have only distinguished themselves as kidnappers. And right. uh, uh, like you, I share a concern that we're uh, hyping hyping the threat here, and that that would be quite dangerous. Mm -hmm. You, uh, in addition to Saudi Arabia, uh, you are one of the few Americans who really knows Pakistan. Um, I don't know how happy you are about that. But, um, <laughs> I like Pakistan. <clears throat> but I'd be curious um, what you think about where um, that troubled country is right now. Um, you know, the old, uh, the old quip among journalists was uh, Pakistan, the next failed state and always will be. Right. Uh, right. It always seems to be headed uh, downhill. It always seems to be uh, having more violence, both um, sectarian and, uh, and, and terrorist, uh, if you will. If you can really distinguish between those two, the, the economy is uh, uh, seemingly always in a, in a state of uh, decay. Uh, just um, yesterday, the top law enforcement official in, uh, in Khyber Pakhtunwa was killed. Um, uh, do we have any reason to be um, optimistic about the long term? We've had a, we have had two civilian governments in a row, which is a first ever, although, as we all know, the civilians are not in charge. So, right, well, uh, and, and <laughs> as we know from our own experience in Washington, having a civilian government is not always what it's cracked up to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Um, so, yes, I mean, I think a lot of the dark, perpetual sort of perpetual crisis narrative about Pakistan that we get inevitably, and you know, we've all written it where the news leads. We have a limited uh, detention span in this country, and we have limited sources of news information about Pakistan, and it's, it's fundamentally not, it's, it's fundamentally not um, helpful to think of it simply as a, as a spiral in one direction, because it's just not accurate. And so take the economy, for example. Uh, Pakistan's economy between uh, 2001 and 2007 grew at about six or seven percent a year, and it's not just that it grew on the top line GDP. Um, if you went down to the Indus River Valley, where agriculture was booming, and where you have all these market towns that are that are you know sort of tied to export industries in Hyderabad and Karachi, I mean the place was people were and the World Bank has documented this people were moving out of poverty at unprecedented rates. I mean whole families were you know sort of economically and socially mobile and in the in a way that you would see in northern India you know during the same boom period. Now the floods, the global economic crisis and and the rise of an insurgency domestically in western Pakistan, terrible governance and all of the things that are familiar to us have you know, I don't mean to suggest that this is a success story, but Pakistan never shrank even during the financial uh, crisis. Its rates of growth fell behind the rates of population growth, but it's still, you know, it's a, it's a complex, resilient society. And I think Anatole Levin's book, Pakistan, a Hard Country, though, you know, I don't agree with every aspect of its framing. I think it's a very useful counterweight to the standard kind of Newsweek coverage story uh, narrative, not to pick on Newsweek. Which, and, well, which actually... <clears throat> world's most went, dangerous country. Went the way of history before Pakistan. <laughs> right, before yeah. Pakistan, <laughs> yes, that's true. Uh, but, you know, the main thing in the kind of political narrative now is that you have two things going on at the same time. On the one hand, well, three things I'll mention. One is this uh, transition, successful transition from one fully serving civilian government to another after a, an election that the world correctly judged as mostly free and fair, uh, you know, pretty good in the circumstances. It's the first time that's happened in Pakistani history. That's a big deal. And it's not just, it's not something that just happened. It's something that Pakistani political leaders, civil society, business leaders constructed. I mean, when the army and others were about to mess with this transition, for the first time the PPP and the 
and the right, the uh, PML and Nawaz Sharif's party, agreed. They stood together even though they're death rivals for power. And so they've constructed this transition. Now what good it'll do, we'll see. But it's a big deal. The second thing that's happening is that all of the leadership that's been in place in Pakistan since things started really going bad in 2007. So General Kiani, the chief of army staff, has been very powerful, self-extended his term. Uh, the PPP-led government that was elected after Benazir Bhutto's assassination, uh, you know, led by uh, Zardari. And the chief justice, who has been the center of kind of an assertion of judicial power in Pakistan that didn't have any precedence. They're all leaving at the same time. So now Kiani's retired. Have we named his successor? Uh, it was supposed to happen this week. Anyway, Kiani's retiring in a couple of weeks. Uh, Nawaz Sharif is the new prime minister, and the chief justice is stepping down. So this whole proposition that Pakistan can sustainably move towards civilian-led, shared governance um, is now going to be tested all over again, and we'll see where we are in five years. The, the last thing is, all of this would be a lot more uh, would present a lot more cause for um, tempered optimism if uh, the Pakistani Taliban weren't waging such a persistent and virulent insurgency, mostly in the Pashto-speaking areas of uh, Western Pakistan, federally administered tribal areas, and um, uh, what do we call it? K, K, KP? No, 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 K2P. K, K, oh, P, uh, no, anyway, uh, there's Pakti, a two. Pakti, 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 anyway, uh, anyway and, uh, so uh, there, and, and, and that insurgency in southern Punjab has also become you know, persistent and embedded in places like Balpur, now no-go no, no zones uh, for many people, including Pakistani police, never mind Western reporters. So the, um, I, the, stale, the, sur, the insurgency has become a stalemate. Uh, the Taliban have, um, every time the Taliban, Pakistani Taliban, have taken important territory, as they did in SWAT last time around, uh, the Pakistani state, including public opinion, the police, the army, young soldiers who are going to give their lives you know, on the front lines, they all have rallied and pushed the Taliban out. But they have not, they do not have the national capacity, uh, they have not demonstrated the national capacity to defeat or co-opt the insurgency in its homeland to the west of Pakistan, and that has created this long, violent stalemate that's been going on really since the raid on the Red Mosque in July of 2007. That's six years now. And that, that has a corrosive effect when you live in a, a constant insurgency. It, it pressures the state. It, it has all kinds of knock-on effects. Well, um, there's an awful lot more to cover, but I thought maybe we'd move to another um, uh, even less uh, uh, joyous place right now, one that you've been writing with a great deal of passion about, and that is Syria. And, um, you know, I was, I was very much impressed by your piece on chemical weapons because mm. I was uh, sort of disappointed at how uh, caught up that issue became in all kinds of questions of what is our long-term strategy in Syria and... Uh, what is this going to do to the UN and the military comments that were, I thought, very much beside the point. Uh, but I'd be interested um, <clears throat> in the aftermath of that, whether uh, what you're thinking is now. You took a very nuanced position about, yes, chemical weapons, you've crossed a red line, but you had an understanding for President Obama's desire not to get involved otherwise. Mm. So I, I know it's always unfair to ask a journalist to prescribe policy, but where do you think <laughs> we should be? going in Syria? Well, I think, the, you know, I'm, I'll probably uh, evade a direct answer to that question, but uh, the, um, the first thing I'd say, of course, as you know, the war is changing so rapidly, and this whole episode uh, that followed the <coughs> appalling um, murder of, what was it, 1400 in the end, um, uh, people outside of in the suburbs of Damascus, you know, has itself changed the character of the war in so many different ways. And, and the, the, the sort of sad part of that is that um, though it wasn't the intention of presumably anyone other than Assad, his henchmen, and Vladimir Putin, it has had the effect of reinforcing Assad's uh, position uh, to a point now where it's much harder to imagine where the pressure 
to force his departure from power and a proper negotiation for the reconstruction of a federated, um, you know, plural state a la Bosnia. I mean, that's the only kind of end state you can ever imagine once the violence uh, would wear down that would be just and sustainable would be something uh, where um, Assad departs and the Alawite community and the, and the Christian community that is sheltered under Alawite protection negotiates for some kind of order and there is, uh, you know, peacekeeping and, and, and the rest of some sort, um, you know, a Lebanon-like mess with periodic eruptions of violations of the, of the agreements, but, but essentially uh, a burned out embers organized in a plural state under international sort of supervision and support of some type. So that requires Assad's departure, in my opinion. And, and, and now he's reinforced. And so the lesson of his father, which is you just tough it out, you kill enough people, and you hold you know, at least one great power close, and, uh, and you can get through it. You know that looks like a much more plausible strategy than it did, but but how uh, it, you know how, you could argue for much longer than we want to about why that happened. It certainly wasn't President Obama's intention, <laughs> but when uh, he set off the chain, when his White House set off the chain of events, we were talking about this earlier. The one thing that really appalls me about that sequence of events, more just as a Washington guy, you know, who's watched presidencies in so many different circumstances, I have I can't remember another White House that made such a consequential decision about congressional, a congressional vote without an accurate head count. count. I mean, you, that's, just, that's like blocking and tackling in Washington. You, know, you don't go to Congress and put your whole presidency on the line unless you are very confident on the basis of experience and head counts and whips and networks that you're going to get what you want. You know, I mean, uh, George H.W. Bush got a war powers vote, uh, and it was closer than it, it looked because lots of people, knowing that the vote would go a certain way, kind of lined up at the end to make it a narrow, to, for political purposes. So I, that, was the, that was the unforced error to me in that whole sequence because it created the circumstances in which Putin rescued Obama from his own dilemma uh, and then ended up linking this very important reassertion of the global norm against chemical weapons use to Assad's um, entrenchment. Right, and the, the irony, of course, is that it appears the White House made that decision after watching the British fail to do their nose counting. Right, yes. <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah. you know, I guess the, the, uh, the moral of the story is don't try this at home. But um, uh, yeah, uh, I agree with you, uh, quite a... Uh, Quite a bumble there. So let's move closer to uh, that other area of interest that, uh, that we share, journalism. And first of all, I'll ask you a question that's sort of in the overlapping area, which is uh, you've been writing a lot about um, uh, the, uh, how the administration has been treating the press. We've had some absolutely staggering leaks. Um, and in the case of the Snowden disclosures, arguably, and I share this view, the, the greatest compromise of intelligence in history. And this was repeated again yesterday by um, uh, the head of the uh, British uh, MI5. And I think that if you took a lot of people in Washington aside, they would, they would agree. Um, this, I think, <coughs> these sorts of things happen in uh, newspapers sometimes without people um, you know, having a chance perhaps to do the surveying and the reconnaissance to figure out what it is exactly that was going on. And this is a, an enormous change. You wrote back uh, some months ago that you thought that in the end these, this, this and the WikiLeaks served a public interest. And I was wondering if you still feel that way, if you want to elaborate on that. Yeah, I mean, I think. Especially as someone who knows intelligence better than, than yeah. any reporter. Well, I, let me just sort of. Uh, set a slightly different context, and then I'll address that. I think, um, you know, the first thing to bear in mind is that we are in a period of extraordinary disruption to our regime of free expression and press law. And, uh, you know, in journalism in this country, uh, we had a period of extraordinary stability between the Sullivan libel case in uh, 1963, which established the world's most permissive environment for journalists, uh, journalists in terms of libel law, and then the Pentagon Papers, 
establishing um, uh, you know, prior restraint practice. If not, you can debate whether the constitutional principle is established. But between Pentagon Papers and um, Sullivan and WikiLeaks, you had a period of great stability and space for journalism, and that also coincided with the rise of very strong self-funding independent media organizations where we were both employed, time in your case, in the Washington Post and mine. So that period of stability ended with WikiLeaks. And what you have now is um, an entirely uh, new and globalized era of um, argument about um, free expression, press law, and the public interest. And it's all you have to do is survey the world right now. You see Julian Assange under indictment in Sweden for um, assault crimes, uh, accepting refuge in the embassy of Ecuador, uh, a country with deeply illiberal press laws, and celebrated by the great majority of the European public as a champion of press freedom. Okay, so that is a picture riddled with contradictions. Uh, and then you have Edward Snowden, a uh, young man, don't really understand his motivations yet, but um, he, he, he saw himself as acting in a, in a public spirit. Then he flees uh, to Hong Kong, uh, spends time in proximity to the government of the People's Republic of China, uh, with, which has quite an illiberal regime in many respects, and ends up accepting um, sanctuary in Russia. So, that's the context in which all of these things have to be evaluated. When I said that I thought that the disclosures were net-net in the public interest, I think that the WikiLeaks uh, State Department cables, in my judgment, uh, did more to illuminate um, public policy and actually to, to reinforce the credibility in, in some ways of uh, your colleagues at the State Department than they, than they did harm. I'm not aware I am quite sensitive to the disclosures of confidential conversations, sources, human rights activists, and others. And I take seriously the argument that's been made by the State Department that those names and disclosures um, you know, jeopardize people. But there was a filter uh, through the first phase of the WikiLeaks disclosures through editing at the New York Times, The Guardian, Der Spiegel, and elsewhere that, uh, that I think I'm not aware of any demonstrated case of any loss of life associated with those disclosures. Now, the Snowden matter is entirely different, and I, I can't really get my, um, my mind around it. What I take note of in the Snowden narrative in public is that when those disclosures were first made broad brush about metadata and uh, um, the scale of generalized surveillance, even though some of it may have been legal under the, the post-Patriot Act, I forget the name of that extension law, um, that the initial reaction was um, across the political spectrum to label Snowden a traitor and to seek you know, his prosecution, his unmitigated prosecution on espionage. And yet, however many months later, three or four months, um, you know, Congress and the public and, and the President have taken a very different view of the public policy matters around the issues he raised. They, they want to revise the, the statutes. They are, you know, the view is that we do have a problem. The exposure of, of Inspector General findings of the, of the error rate inside FISA, the, the exposure of very, and now in, in attempting to defend an aspect of the regime, the administration has adopted a, a policy of transparency and proactive disclosure about the nature of, of practices that they were previously not prepared to disclose. So how can you say that that has no public interest benefit? It does. The, 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 the thing that's staggering about the Snowden files, and I, I know this from you know, some of the people who are working with them, is that a friend of mine said, um, not one of the people who's involved in the journalism, but who is aware of it, said, uh, you know, this is the first time in American history where journalists have been asked to decide what secrets are in the public interest and what secrets are too dangerous. I mean, you have all of these journalists sitting around talking to each other, looking through these PowerPoint presentations and asking one another, well, do you think any harm would come from disclosing this aspect, or should we sanitize this and get this public? I mean, it's, it's not a function that journalists have uh, ordinary, ordinarily carried out. The one last thing that I've been reflecting on, I'm not sure how, how directly relevant it is to your question, but I'll mention it anyway, because it, in journalism, at the journalism school, with young aspiring journalists in our graduate school, you know, in public fora like this, 
you know, one is constantly um, talking about how Assange and Snowden um, essentially define journalism in this age, or a certain kind of investigative journalism. But really, from the perspective, and so set that aside for a minute. When we talk about investigative journalism in our open society, in this country, in the state of New Hampshire, we are not talking about insiders with top secret security clearances downloading files onto thumb drives and walking across the room and handing them to a journalist or going building their own website. What was the role of journalism in Snowden's disclosure? He could just as easily have published this on a website himself. He could have moved to Iceland and done it. He barely used the journalists as intermediaries. He basically dumped the whole thing out there as his own act of, of uh, you know, civil disobedience, I guess is the way he would put it. Well, you know, real journalism isn't about that. That's not how journalism happens. Real journalism is about turning up, I mean, I don't mean real journalism, a, the traditional form of, of journalism that communities have relied on to hold their politicians to account has been practiced uh, one zoning board meeting at a time, one campaign finance disclosure at a time, data sets about patterns of police abuse by the Boston police, who they, how many people do they shoot in cars uh, when their cars are fleeing. I mean, this kind of workaday civil society uh, efforts to generate transparency around government power are of a different character, is all I'm saying, than um, uh, Snowden and, and Assange. And what's happened is that the Obama administration has chilled the environment in which even that work goes on because they have taken such an aggressive approach to um, leak cases and the assertion of journalistic privilege. And they've done it on national security pretext, but the effect of it is universal. It has to do with reporters and sources at every level of uh, American democracy. Well, wait a second. That's a, that's a pretty big charge. Uh, where are the reporters who are being intimidated about uh, you know, checking up on police brutality? Well, because in all of the, because the main, one of the biggest <clears throat> contested issues in American constitutional law around journalism is the right of a journalist to assert a limited privilege comparable to the privilege of clergy or psychiatrists to protect confidential sources in the case uh, that they are subpoenaed before a grand jury. That matter is undecided, essentially. I mean, you can get an argument, but the main case that reviewed it at the Supreme Court which arose from a grand jury case in Kentucky involving a reporter for the Louisville Courier Journal who had investigated marijuana manu or hashish manufacturers in Louisville, that basic idea of whether a journalist and a source have any space in which to engage confidentially is, um, is contested at federal courts, at circuits around the country, and a wiser government than the Obama administration and its, just, and its attorney general would have approached the concerns it had in national security without attempting to eviscerate this privilege, but that's exactly what they did. The briefs they filed in every <coughs> circuit, the, the, the way they have attempted to make national law and the guidelines that Eric Holder followed when he subpoenaed the AP records have established precedents that uh, judges, courts, prosecutors at every level of, of the American press regime are going to follow. I mean. There's let's, uh, it's not arguable. Let's revisit this one in a couple of years because I'm betting that uh, the, uh, the political understanding at every level of government is going to be, if it isn't uh, a, major, uh, a major leak that damages national security, there's going to be no political space to prosecute that. Well, that's, that's happened since July. I mean, essentially the turning point in this story, um, I this hope, was, uh, was, was, well, it was Obama's speech followed the exposure of two very bad decisions that the Attorney General signed off on, unforced errors. One was to sign an affidavit that characterized uh, a Fox News reporter who entered into a conversation with a government official as a co-conspirator in a violation of the Espionage Act. And the only reason that Fox News reporter was in that conversation because he was a professional reporter seeking information, as reporters do. So that stepped over a line in, and produced public and political reaction. And the second thing was the AP subpoena, which involved um, essentially um, subpoenaing a bunch of uh, a wide range of reporter and editor records 
uh, without notification to the target organization, and it was a departure from, you know, basically 30 years of attorney general guidelines, um, and the case for doing it just wasn't very compelling. So you had this massive, uh, it was almost like an automatic pilot that the National Security Division of the Justice Department had finally just pushed the line so far that people couldn't see the line anymore. And they weren't reviewing these decisions with enough people in the room, and they made a bunch of bad decisions. Then the public and, the, and Congress reacted, and then the president made his speech, ordered uh, Holder to review the matter, Holder issued new guidelines in July. On paper, those new guidelines are pretty good. And if they become the law of the land uh, over the next 10 or 20 years, we'll be better off um, slightly. But anyway, that's, the, that's how so I see it. So I agree with you that uh, this is an aberration in journalism, having uh, Snowden deliver all this uh, information uh, in the way he did. But I, uh, I want to probe a little further. If you were still managing editor of uh, The Post, how would you have felt if someone dropped that flash drive on your desk? Well, I would try to understand what's in it and what matters of public interest it contains. And, um, you know, the, the question of receiving, um, you know, leaked information from sources is not novel in this case. What's novel is the volume um, and the complexity and the, con and the contested claims about the damage uh, that is contained in that file. That's very, that's unusual. Normally, when you get into a situation where you acquire, for example, um, operational detail. This, here's the easiest ethical ca mm -hmm. case to teach at a journalism school. So um, uh, a reporter learns that uh, um, the FBI um, has identified a, a violent um, uh, terrorist, um, you know, living in a, um, uh, a house in suburban Boston, and uh, they've um, documented this person's purchase of bomb-making materials, and they've eavesdropped on him, according to the uh, FBI, and the next morning they're going to make an arrest, and this guy doesn't know it's coming. And uh, you have it the night before. Are you going to put it on the nightly news and tip the target? Right. Why is that in the public interest? I mean, <laughs> that's not in the public interest. There's no public interest served by tipping the target. So people withhold information about operational and technical detail all the time. The, the Snowden thing is just of an order of magnitude. I mean, I, I know some things that I can't talk about with a video camera running or in front of a public audience about what that material is, but I, I would just say that I think from what's been described in public about the sheer volume of it, he carried out massive amounts of material. And it's completely unedited. I mean. I'm not sure that he, he didn't understand what was on all those slides in many cases, right? So there are a lot of PowerPoint slides, and there, it, it's Washington. There's a lot of acronyms. You know, if you, if you don't have top secret compartment and clearance to some of these acronyms, even you at the State Department wouldn't have known what they meant, right? So the, it's, it's very difficult to uh, just drop the flash drive, open it up, and say publish or not publish. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a question of, of of understanding that I think is um, essential to any form of journalism, even, even, if, um, even if you're not trying to be responsible, you still ought to at least understand what you think the story is about. Do you think that happens? I find it difficult to evaluate. I think that some of the top line disclosures about the use of metadata, I mean, I have thought that if I really wanted to have the kind of understanding about that question that perhaps I should have, that I would need to go to a cabin and pull out all of the coverage and all of the slides that have been disclosed and posted on the Guardian's website <laughs> and go back to when this began in May and just read it all systematically and try to figure out what I understand and what I don't understand. Because even as a, as a very attentive consumer to the raw disclosures, like the PowerPoint slides and the rest, and, and as someone who knows something about how the telecommunications industry works, I still don't understand 30% of what I've read. And uh, I understand some of the big arguments about uh, metadata. I understand that there is an assertion of error rate and sloppiness in the system that gets my attention. I understand that that's been found. I also understand that the people who have been criticized say, well, it was not as bad as, as the Inspector General or the FISA court made it out to be. How are we as citizens of, a, of an open society notionally protected by the Fourth Amendment, supposed to evaluate these claims. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, that's one of those areas in which the complexity 
sort of defies democratic uh, right. uh, efforts. And, and, and I, I am entirely sympathetic with everyone in this audience who I presume holds this view, which is, I'm sorry, you know, um, trust us is not good enough. Right, you're gonna you're gonna need to. There's got to be more than that as a, as a although, defense. Although let's remember that the trust was established by the agreement of all three branches of government that this program was uh, uh, was legal, viable, and essential. Yeah, but the court that reviewed it, the FISA court, has circumstantially a record that is not very persuasive to me. I mean, you essentially have. Um, I know from people who present to the FISA court that they respect the fact that a lot of bad cases get filtered out before they, a lot, a lot of uh, warrants and subpoenas get filtered out, bad warrants get filtered out before the court rules on them, but this court is, um, you know, basically it's a thousand to zero on the <coughs> approval side. And if you look at the judges that have been approved, the degree of scrutiny they've received, I mean, I'm not, you know, I, I'm, I'm unpersuaded that the judicial oversight um, of this program has been as rigorous as the American people would normally okay. expect it to be. So it certainly hasn't been transparent. So let's move on. I know that a lot of people want to ask questions, but I have a few more that are just on, on the press for you. Um, I think that there is a public perception uh, that um, the Fourth Estate is in free fall, that so many papers have closed, uh, so many have drastically cut back their uh, uh, their newsrooms. Uh, you know, there's sort of 500 varieties of chaos on on cable television. Uh, tell us why this perception is 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 right or wrong. Well, I mean, we're in a period of you know profound disruption in the profession of journalism and in the media industry. It's a period of creative destruction. A lot of legacy institutions are in free fall and many of them are disappearing. Newsweek is one of them. Um, a lot of new organizations are being born. There are a lot of questions about where revenue to fund um, fact-based, sustained, quality, professional journalism will come from. It's not um, as if there are no answers to that question. There are some uh, journalism organizations, for example, business organizations that produce news that moves market prices or helps investors, they're generally pretty healthy and you can imagine that the Wall Street Journal will be around for a good while. Bloomberg is successful for a reason. Um, you know, do you want all of your foreign correspondence filtered through kind of a, a business um, relevance filter? In New York Times, as we were discussing at lunch, is the, um, the institution that's on the cusp. They've achieved a lot in their drive to become sustainable on the basis of a quality and um, um, uh, a readership that's willing to pay for quality strategy, but they're not there yet. So uh, they've, they've come a long way, but uh, they haven't demonstrated that they're going to be around for 50 years. There was a, as newspapers shrank, there was a, uh, a call for nonprofit and other civil society organizations for public radio to fill up some of the space that those uh, commercial newsrooms were leaving behind in terms of uh, working reporters turning up at zoning board meetings and holding attorneys general to account. I, was, I testified at a hearing that John Kerry held before the Senate Commerce Committee about the future of journalism, improbably enough. Uh, I, David Simon, who created The Wire, a uh, great old Baltimore Sun reporter, in, for some reason insisted that I testify. And he was there, and Ariana Huffington, and Melissa Mayer of Google, and Alberto Ibarguen from the Knight Foundation, and the best exchange was when Claire McCaskill, who is the senator from Missouri, who was a former um, prosecutor, uh, said that when she was in, in St. Louis um, exercising prosecutorial discretion, no doubt over wiretap and other uh, <laughs> cases of public interest, she said every time she had a hard call, she remembered the Globe Democrat reporter who had covered the federal courts in St. Louis for the last 20 years, who knew everybody, everybody talked to him. Uh, he'd, he'd seen it all and he was a fierce reporter. And she basically said every time she made a decision, she thought of him and she said, what will he think? <laughs> and, and that was like one of the last checks. Now, he's gone. Globe Democrat doesn't have that kind of a beat reporter anymore. And it was kind of an, a moving story, but then uh, David Simon said, well, but you, that's in some ways, for all of you senators up there, uh, this is great news because you've now arrived in office at the cusp of the golden age of corruption. <laughs> 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 so, 
you know, I think what's happening in our county governments um, around these issues at zoning boards, I mean, basic blocking and tackling conflict of interest stuff that you would do as a professional newspaper reporter in even, I mean, even in wealthy counties, just basic checks. Uh, okay, this guy just got on the zoning board. Does he own any real estate? Uh, well, let's look at that. Does he have brothers? Does, he, does the brother own any real estate? I mean, just basic stuff on a Monday morning is just not happening anymore, and we're going to feel it. So, last question, then we'll turn over to the audience. Uh, as um, dean of the foremost school of journalism in the country, how do you train journalists? How do you prepare them for this new and rather unorganized, disparate, creative destruction world of journalism that uh, you have uh, described in that great Schumpeterian phrase? Yeah, so some things are the same and some things are new, and that's been true at this school of journalism since it was built in 1913. I mean, Joseph Pulitzer endowed the school and wrote this big, very foresightful, he was not um, the New York Times in his day. Uh, I read his biography as I came in to do this job, and he's an amazing story. He's Hungarian, uh, from a Hungarian Jewish family who answered an ad to serve as a mercenary in the Civil War because when the draft was imposed in the North, you could, sub, you could hire a substitute and they started advertising in Europe. So he came over as a German speaker, as a substitute for some kid in the Hudson Valley who didn't want to fight in 1864, ended up in this all German speaking cavalry unit, rode up and down the Shenandoah Valley in 1864 and 1865, never fired a shot, was discharged. Now he was a citizen of the United States, didn't speak a word of English. He went to St. Louis where there were a lot of other German speakers, started a newspaper, got involved in politics, became an investigative reporter, wrote an investigative report about a Republican he didn't like, who, about who was going to compete for office. The guy came to the newsroom to complain about the story, and Pulitzer pulled out a pistol and shot him. All right, so, so this is my, this is my, didn't kill him, winged him. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, this is like my founding narrative at the journalism school. And then, then later in life, when he built up the New York world and was one of the great press barons of the 19th century, he became uh, convinced that there was a profession of journalism that could be elevated and sustained as a part of democratic kind of accountability in the United States. And he wrote these essays at the end of his life. Uh, you know, I invite you to read them. They were incredibly foresightful and, and really well organized and, and deep. And you would sort of, they're literally, we put them up on the wall in stone at the entry of the building. So a little hard to reconcile all this, but the point is, Journalism and the aspiration of reporting, investigative reporting, transparency, accountability in an open society has been around. He started that school before there was radio. So technological disruption is an inevitable part of um, the profession of journalism, and we must accept it as that, and we ought not to succumb to euphoria or to uh, too much um, um, conviction that the state of technological change at any one moment is, is defining for decades to come because it has never proven to be the case. So the implication is that there is an enduring mission at the school to teach critical thinking, clear thinking, uh, subject matter expertise, uh, writing, and um, ethics, and above all, reporting, investigative reporting. It doesn't matter what tool you have in your hand, whether it's a radio microphone or a television camera or um, a small handheld video camera or a notebook and a pen, which was what we mostly trafficked with, um, it's still in the end about going out and asking questions, hard questions, choosing good subjects, clarifying in what matters, holding closed institutions to account before the public, attempting to bear professional and reliable witness to great atrocities and to hidden um, events, telling stories of excluded communities, excluded peoples, all, we can make a list of you know, the 50 or 60 uh, functions of journalism that people respect and, and find valuable in a democratic society. That skill, and it's not you know, as hard to learn how to do that it is, as it is to be a brain surgeon, but it's, it does require preparation, training, mentorship, experience. That's what the school has to teach. And we also have to update our skill building and the tools that we give students. I mean, as a practical matter for a young journalist coming out of school today, whether you come out of a, you know, an undergraduate degree and you find your way into a newsroom or whether you come out of graduate school, you've got to be able to do something that my generation of young journalists didn't have to do, which is you've got to use a lot of tools at the same time. You've got to be able to um, write and think clearly. 
and on deadline, but you also need to be able to use a camera. You need to have some idea how to edit video and audio, even if it's just on your uh, MacBook Pro or with Adobe. You've got to um, have some idea of how data science is emerging, where data is located, how to sort it, how to assess it. Uh, and you've got to be able to engage with audiences through social media. You've got, to, you've got to find where your audience is. And to learn how to do all of that simultaneously while remaining focused on the kind of reporting that really makes a difference and makes it all worthwhile in the first place, um, it's, it's, it's a tough challenge. For the school, it means we have to update our, our skill delivery um, while we remain confident about the core values. And, the schools, I think, you know, in a position to continue to do that, but the pace of change in the technology is so great. It's a lot of it's exciting. I'll just finish by saying, you know, there are a lot of um, exciting new tools that you can apply to the hard problems of journalism, algorithms, computational science, uh, natural language processing, drones, uh, sensors. Um, you know. There, and there's a lot of excitement in the field about how these new tools may enable uh, journalism, but they will really, the purpose of all this technology can't be, at the end of the day, just to make better maps. You know, I mean, maps are good, maps are a part of publishing. It's got to be about addressing the hard problems of journalism. You know, where are the closed institutions that frustrate us? How do we document corruption? How do we, how do we replace the fact that there's no reporter at the zoning board who's going to pro produce these routine checks on behalf of the citizenry about whether the brother owns real estate and whether the real estate is up before the board. Maybe we can write an algorithm to automate that at every jurisdiction in the United States that publishes its data. I mean, these are the kinds of questions that make the technology relevant, not the technology in and of itself. Okay. And are you carrying a gun now? Or, uh... <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let's... Uh... Well, great. Raise your hands, please, and the uh, microphone will come to you. Right back. Back there. Uh, people are saying that, and you've alluded to it already, that we're entering a new era of investigative reporting, for example, where nonprofits are um, partnering with legacy newsrooms to produce meaningful work. What are the big emerging trends you see for investigative reporting, and what role will nonprofit investigative journalism centers have? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think um, after the crisis in newspapers when newsrooms started to shrink, um, philanthropists, foundations, and, and others um, responded with a call for a shift of philanthropic attention to the collapse of this, um, this function, this democratic function of, of accountability reporting. And um, as a result, a lot of investments were made in startup nonprofit news organizations like ProPublica, local ones that sprang up on their own, like Voice of San Diego or MinPost in the Twin Cities area. And um, one of the fears was that these models, as they relied on philanthropy um, and foundation giving, wouldn't prove to be sustainable. And in fact, um, it's still a question hanging over that sector. There are institutions like ProPublica, Center for Investigative Reporting in California, um, and um, a couple of others that have um, proved to be sustainable through philanthropic giving models. They do great work. They've made a real difference. But they um, can't replace the kind of state house, local, police, uh, and political investigative reporting that newspapers have um, left behind as they've shrunk or disappeared. So there's a lot of um, uh, interesting ideas about how that might um, be replaced, that reporting function might be replaced. Some people emphasize the value of citizen journalism, essentially amateur self-appointed kind of watchdogs, a, a kind of town hall approach to democratic accountability journalism. Some people have seen libraries as potentially centers in communities to train volunteer citizens in the techniques of public records reporting and to encourage them through blogs and other means to turn up and provide this sort of reporting. I'm open to those kinds of approaches. I think it's the goal that's necessary. The, you know, the difficulty is sustainability. I don't want to make a kind of reified, you know, um, uh, uh, cult out of the professional salaried working reporter, but I I do think that 
there is a, a difference between what a prof uh, someone trained to carry out professional journalism can do and someone who isn't. That doesn't mean that training can't be distributed into society in a different way, uh, in, a, in, a, in effect in, a, in an a-profit way. It's not really about uh, non-profit or for-profit. It's actually about the function of, of accountability and witnessing and so forth. There are lots of interesting ideas and experiments, but um, they result from, you know, from a professional journalist's perspective, the digital revolution has been enormously disruptive and many people find it to be dis destructive. It's been destructive of their own careers, destructive of their own uh, plans, uh, their own savings in some cases. But it's also been regenerative because it has collapsed the barriers to entry into publishing. The principal structural effect of the digital revolution has been to tear down the walls that prevented any of you from starting a newspaper in Washington, D.C. tomorrow because in the days when I worked at the Washington Post, you would have had to go to Japan, spend $600 million on a printing press, come back, negotiate a contract with, with union drivers to deliver papered newspapers all around the city. I mean, it was a huge barrier to entry. Um, now, you can go down into your uh, basement with some good coding skills and build uh, what you call the Washington Star and, uh, and go down to Congress and carry a notebook and report the day's events and come home and make a newspaper. And if you can figure out how to reach an audience, you're in business. Now, you may not make any money, but, you know, the door is open. So that's the, that's the real um, uh, area where we've yet to see the models form, but where there's a lot of interesting experimentation and possibility. That's back there. Okay, so this is kind of shifting the focus from journalism back to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. I've read a lot about how this, a lot of people believe the Stinger missile or the introduction of the Stinger missile by like the CIA and foreign powers was one of the biggest turning points in the war. Do you agree with this idea or do you think um, the Soviets were inevitably going to lose in Afghanistan? Uh, I commend to you a book called uh, Ghost Wars that somebody uh, wrote. Because <laughs> uh, that's that kind of, there's a, there's a lot of narrative uh, detail about that in there. And, you know, I do, uh, and there's a pretty good um, case study uh, that Harvard's, I think, Kennedy School put together under Ernest May, one of the rare case studies where intelligence officials and others cooperated, you know, about uh, very complex classified decision making and it was basically around the decision to go ahead and ship the stingers in. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it very brief, but um, essentially uh, I think the best evidence is that not the stinger alone, but the ramping up of technological investment in the resistance. Um, it wasn't uh, only the ability to knock these special forces Soviet helicopters out of the sky that started to turn the war and demoralize the Soviets. It was also the fact that the United States started to provide satellite maps of targets, uh, allowing re relatively um, undertrained guerrillas to approach targets, uh, you know, successfully and exit uh, intact. Uh, they gave them also anti-tank missiles. They gave them night vision and uh, sniper rifle capability. They basically put a lot of tools in their hands that they had previously declined to put in their hands. And the motivation was to try to turn the war, to win the war. And now, you know, big war like that is a complicated event. There's no easy way to describe cause and effect. But you have to observe that the decision to invest the guerrillas with these tools coincided in time with achievements on the battlefield and the, and the development of deeper demoralization on the Soviet side. Now, you know, if it hadn't also been the time when Mikhail Gorbachev came to power and wanted to change and recognize the whole Soviet system was failing and wanted to change, I mean, you know, it gets to be silly season with this kind of what if. But um, it was certainly, I would say, there's no question that the introduction of those technologies, including the Stinger, played a very significant role in the course of events between the time they were introduced in 1985 and the time that the Soviet Union decided in 1987 to begin to negotiate a withdrawal. Well, I guess it doesn't matter who I call um, okay. Going back to the uh, chemical weapons incident in Syria this summer, um, I 
read that Assad at one point um, uh, suggested that the, uh, the Taliban was responsible or the um, Al Qaeda was responsible. And I don't follow that. Could you give me your understanding of why that would even be a plausible idea and what the motivation might have been? Well, it's not a plausible idea, but his motivation has been in every instance to blame um, violence against civilians on the opposition. And uh, I think the best evidence from independent human rights groups and, and lots of other sources, though, of course, you know, none of this evidence can be as precise as you would like it, but we've all been in these terrible, you know, witnesses to these terrible wars in the Balkans and in Africa and elsewhere. You know, there, there you can get a pretty good sense of direction. I think the best evidence is that the overwhelming majority of violence against unarmed civilians in the Syrian conflict has been carried out by the Assad regime or its militias. However, there has been a significant amount of violence against civilians uh, in the Syrian conflict carried out by the armed opposition and increasingly the kidnapping and indiscriminate and internal conflicts generated among the opposition and by the opposition towards civilians you know, are a disturbing feature of the war. But Assad's narrative of how to remain in power is to blame it all on terrorists. I mean, his whole Orwellian uh, account of himself is that I'm just fighting George Bush's global war on terror. I, these are all terrorists. Um, and it, it, to some extent, he succeeded in creating a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, but you know, when he started out, you remember where the revolution in Syria began. It's a bunch of teenagers, 13-year-olds, uh, skipping school and spraying graffiti on the wall. And that's where the violence began, too, in those first brutal battles, um, you know, with the mosque as a hospital and these 17-year-olds running into Assad's guns. I mean, it was, you know, if that's, where it, that's what the war really has, was about at the beginning. Now it's a, you know, a much more complex story. The, the, there was, I think it was a C.J. Um, Chibbers article in the Times that was very powerful in describing how it is that the international community concluded, as the UN inspectors concluded, that those uh, shells that killed the 1400 originated with the Assad regime. It's because they were able to trace the trajectory of the shells to a very specific fort and security complex uh, as part of, in, you know, right near the Assad's palace, uh, palace and that that particular <coughs> unit is well known, well established, and. So, you know, I think you, um, the UN, um, you, not even Russia or China dissented from the findings. So I think that's now pretty well established. Right down here, please. <laughs> I'd appreciate your uh, appreciation of what has seemed to me to be underreported in the Manning and Snowden uh, leaks, which is the questionable competence of the architects of our national security apparatus who think that hundreds of thousands of people can get security clearances and have access to the data, uh, in, uh, both the quantity and, and, and quality of data that, that Manning and Snowden had and think that there can be uh, secrecy uh, sustainable uh, with, with so many hundreds of thousands of people uh, having access to this data. Well, what do you think about that? I mean, you could, you could make the case that what the Snowden leaks really exposed was not um, big Brother, but the consequences of the contractor bloated, undermanaged national security. State. No, I, I agree uh, entirely. If you have a million people with top secret clearances, it's not a top secret clearance anymore. Uh, and uh, it's just impossible to control, and the law of averages will catch up with you. Um, but I do think that uh, it's also correct. I mean, the, the information that Snowden had you know, a, a reasonably small number of people had compared to that million, uh, but obviously it's still, it's still too many and it wasn't monitored correctly. And a, as for a private having access to uh, uh, such a large class of diplomatic cables, you know, passes all understanding, so. Shouldn't there be some accountability and, and a story about that? Isn't that the big story? 
uh, yes, but that's uh, that's a case of uh, failure by so many people that um, you know you would you would need a large stadium to figure out how it got that wrong. There was no one point of failure, I'm afraid. So, uh, do you think uh, America is an ex exceptional country? Do I think well, America is an exceptional country? Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Your, your political career uh, yes. rests yeah. on this one. Yeah. I don't. I mean, that's a that's a loaded term, but uh, it's obviously an exceptional country in the sense that it was um, it was born in exceptional circumstances. It has exceptional um, geography and history and an exceptional constitution. That doesn't mean that it has an exceptional right, um, you know, to. Um, you know, to, to manage affairs beyond its own borders in comparison to other sovereign countries, but as a national narrative, of course it's exceptional. India's national narrative is also exceptional. Brazil's national narrative is exceptional in the sense that I'm intending. Sorry, one more thing. Um, I haven't heard much recently about Mula Omar. Like, is there anything like updated about him? I mean, we hear so much about Bin Laden, but I just haven't, I don't really know what happened to him, so I was so you're, wondering. You're so like, you're like my microcosm greatest potential reader, but you haven't read my work yet. I'm so. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was everything that you're interested in is what I write about. So I have, uh, there's a New Yorker story that I did when? Like 2011, 2012? Fairly recently, yes. it's called Searching for Mullah Omar. <laughs> uh, and it's basically as much of an update, it's like 10,000 words on where is Mullah Omar, I, you and I are probably the only people who were interested in that story, but I got my editors to put it in the magazine, so you should go find it and read it. You may have to pay, go behind the paywall to get it, though. You have the Apple Maps uh, sort of <laughs> yeah, locator, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. In, in downtown Florida. I mean, okay. Yes. This is a great conversation, by the way. Thank you both. Um, I have more of a philosophical question. Um, I mean, if you notice through the years that kind of what I would call long-form journalism, whether it's print or on television, like documentaries and stuff, has really, you know, gone away or it's not easy to find. Um, and if you talk to, you know, with the exception of people at certain socioeconomic levels, you talk to the general public, most people are woefully ill-informed about what's going on in the world. Um, you know, take this whole healthcare thing, for instance, that's a classic example. What can places like Columbia or, you know, people in the top notches of journalism do to try to encourage more interest on the part of, you know, more Americans and in, in following what's going on in their country? Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important question, and I'm not sure that an institution like Columbia can, can solve the problem you've identified. We were sort of talking about it at lunch. I mean, along with the disruption to the private sector media industry that the digital era has created, we've also had, coincidentally and for related but distinct reasons, a collapse of um, shared public information um, flawed but shared as modeled by the fact that airwave spectrum in the United States used to be licensed to network broadcasters on a public interest uh, bargain and that their news divisions were understood as the, base, as the justification for these quasi-monopoly grants in effect of, of profit making. And they ran these big news organizations in part so that when they went to the FCC to say, I want to renew my license for KABC television in New York, which is a money mint. Um, by the way, I'm spending $150 million a year on an excellent news organization. And, and the broadcasts were one example of a kind of a public square. Now, you know, you can argue about the flaws of those establishment institutions in there. They certainly carried them as the Washington Post did as well. But we've lost that... Uh, um, public space and one of the consequences of the digital era is that it allows individuals to select their own information universe and and that information universe includes a lot of entertainment that is a you know a distraction from um, I mean that is chosen by many people over um, 
other sorts of inf information. I was mentioning at lunch, I read some social research recently that, that said um, there is a kind of inequality of information in the United States emerging that's parallel to the documented um, gaps in incomes that have spread, and probably for similar reasons. At the very top of the demographic spectrum, um, individuals know more about public and international subjects than they did a generation ago. They are consuming more. They're also um, absorbing more because they, they demonstrate more knowledge about global and national affairs than they did a generation ago. But in the middle and at the bottom of, of the information demographic spectrum, people are opting out. It's not that they um, don't have access to the information, a minimum uh, amount of information. They, they are willfully choosing ignorance. <laughs> that's, what, that's how they would prefer to organize their time. So I don't know how to kind of document what they're doing exactly with their time, but there is no um, public square that forces them to reckon with some common stream of information and news. And uh, that's a choice that we make as a country. We have a public media policy uh, in this country that is as laissez-faire as any, more laissez-faire than any uh, industrialized democracy on earth. I mean, by orders of magnitude, we never quite understand how different we are in some of our public policies, but we spend less money per capita on public media. I mean, public radio stations, public newsrooms, public television, or put it in libraries and make for information centers for citizen journalists, whatever it is you want to define as public media. On a per capita basis, we are so far off the charts. I, I, I used to have the numbers at the top of my head, but it's like something like we spend a, a buck and the next lowest industrialized democracy, Canada, I think spends seven bucks. You get to like Germany and Japan, they're spending twenty-five, thirty dollars. Uh, you know, and if you just go live in you know the UK for a few years and 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 pay your seventy-five pound annoying television tax and turn on the BBC and you've got you know you've got a world organization that now that is a that is an institution that for all of the contention around it has survived conservative governments and labor governments and Margaret Thatcher and everybody under the sun because it's a national consensus that public media has a value in a democracy, creates a public square. And, and we, in including journalists, I mean, I took a bunch of arrows in my back in 2009 when I wrote a long essay calling for, you know, a more sensible public media policy, including um, government uh, investments in next generation national public radio uh, institutions, stations, and the national network. <coughs> And I took them mostly from my own colleagues, who are who are who are so um, determined to maintain their independence from government, which I totally admire. That they, um, in my judgment, fail to recognize that we already have a public media policy in this country. It involves tax subsidies uh, and license grants to uh, commercial cable and satellite broadcasters. We have a public media policy. It's just a really bad policy. <laughs> and, and it needs to be updated. <laughs> so we update our public policies from time to time. This would be a good time to consider the information deficits in our society and how we might make relatively inexpensive uh, public investments to address them. I know that sounds like Swedish socialism, but I'm willing to own it. <laughs> and, and I'm sure that as we head for the next uh, set of budget discussions in January and yeah, February, and I, this will be... Well, you know, the, uh, the funny thing about the politics of public media, just not to uh, let that uh, perfectly that's... reasonable joke go, <laughs> is that you know who the congressional constituents of public television are? Because we did some mapping at New America because I was interested in trying to figure out you know, how to have a smarter conversation about this. They're actually not um, by coastal blue state constituents. They're rural states that don't have other media. So you know, Maine, North Dakota, uh, you know, I mean, these are the, these are the, and you, so you have a fair number of, this was why Milt, Mitt Romney was once again so tone deaf when he took on Big Bird, because Big Bird's political constituents are actually mostly in red states that don't have a lot of other content, and they don't have broadband connectivity, so they don't have a world of uh, choices on laptops. Uh, so you could build a bipartisan coalition for a smarter public media strategy, but you'd have to you'd have to have a vision. <laughs>
we had a visitor here a week or two ago who pointed out that the state that had the uh, largest percentage of its population on the public uh, public employment rolls was Wyoming. So right. there are paradoxes on top of paradoxes right. here. Right. Right. Anyway, we have come to the end of our time, I'm afraid. Uh, Steve, you've once again demonstrated that you can speak uh, with ferocious uh, uh, eloquence on more subjects than anyone I know. And I just wanted to say if that thing in New York doesn't work out, you just come back and talk to us. <laughs> uh, you are always welcome here. It was terrific. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much.